Welcome back to wagertalk.com. I'm Marco D'Angelo joined in studio. Special guest this week, Mike Tanay. Mike, so glad to have you here. And whenever I talked to people and we mentioned on Twitter that we were going to have you in, I got to find out who all of the uh, closet wrestling fans are in my organization because everybody was like jealous. Uh, and I got to tell you that I'm probably going to be calling you quite a bit uh, when some of these cappers come into town that are big wrestling fans. He said, you got to set up a lunch with Mike, please, please. So uh, that was for you, Dwayne and Johnny. Uh, you guys want to uh, meet you. And, um, but I'm a little bit embarrassed because my wrestling knowledge um, pretty much ended back with uh, Bruno San Martino uh, when I was in Pittsburgh and uh, anybody that was from Pittsburgh, uh, whether you were a wrestling fan or not, you knew of Bruno San Martino. And I was a wrestling fan, Bruno, George Animal Steel, but then I kind of got away from it. So I'm going to be just asking the questions here today. There you go. I'm ready. <laughs> All right. Um, unbelievable how you got started in this. And um, you told me the story last week and it just blew my mind at 11 years old you were writing a wrestling newsletter back in the day and this thing was pretty good yeah it was a wrestling newsletter at the same time i decided that i would start submitting stories to the newsstand wrestling magazines and they were immediately picked up and i started getting paid at age 11 for submitting these stories about the wrestlers. And I guess maybe that says something about the state of wrestling journalism. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure, but uh, I enjoyed it at the time. It was really fun and very unique uh, industry to say the least, but that's how I got started at the age of 11. Yeah, you got started and uh, it spiraled in and we talked in another earlier video how uh, you got on radio and you were doing a wrestling show and that kind of led to your first job at TNT. Tell us about that. Yes, uh, Ted Turner's organization, which was WCW, decided that they were going to provide a pay-per-view with wrestlers from Mexico. This was something in addition to what they normally would be having on their schedule. And the in-house announcers that work for Turner and WCW, they decided that they did not want to be a part of this because they would be exposed doing a three-hour event, a pay-per-view, uh, with wrestlers that they had no idea who they were, what their moves were, what their backgrounds were. So they contacted me. Uh, they knew that uh, growing up in Southern California, I was very aware of a lot of the Hispanic wrestlers. Uh, in addition, I had the experience from radio. They said, we've got this big event coming up. And it was in 1994 at the LA Sports Arena called When Worlds Collide. And that was my entree. And it was just very fortunate that the event was so good. Because in so many instances, if you're announcing and the event is not good, you're going to be graded by the fact that, you know, the, the in-ring action is not that good, so the announcing's not that good. It was a great event, and people look back on it even today as one of the great wrestling pay-per-views of all time. Great. And then that uh, spiraled into a regular gig for you? It did. Uh, Turner Broadcasting realized that uh, the way that the population base in the United States was going probably was a good idea to get a lot of the Hispanic wrestlers on the roster. They did so. Uh, I was brought in as the expert commentator for those matches. And uh, from that point on, I just sort of I just was able to keep that position. And then they added me to the regular Monday Nitro crew. And it was one of the hottest shows in its time in the late 90s. Uh, when the Monday Nitro and Monday Night Raw that the WWE had at the time were going head to head. Just amazing that the ratings that those shows were doing, and it sounds funny to look back on it these days, but there was actually concern on the part of Monday Night Football because those two wrestling shows, they were eroding the ratings for Monday Night Football. That's a big statement. Yep. In as good as it was and as long of a run as it was, the WCW ended up, um, you know, folding up. Uh, you were there from the beginning. What do you think was the downfall? Well, I think so much of wrestling is based on what's called booking or creative. And it's like writing a TV show. It's like writing a movie. I think what we did at that point was we got away from more of a sports-based booking keeping things as legitimate as possible, putting emphasis on the championships, having rivalries and grudges between guys with issues that people can relate to. And I think we got into more of an entertainment mode. Of course, it's professional wrestling. So you're gonna need that entertainment aspect. It's the last thing that you wanna take away. But I think when you add too much entertainment into the mix and into the package, you turn a lot of people off. So I think if you look today at how popular the UFC is, 
I think one of the biggest things is UFC is based around sports type booking. It's guys fighting for championships. It's guys that have grudges, that have matches in the octagon. Not necessarily where their promos are scripted, but nonetheless, they're told that you're gonna make a bonus on this next pay-per-view, uh, depending on the number of buys, so guys aren't afraid to get the heat going between them and their opponent. Great stuff. Um, if you, uh, you know, since the end of the WCW, there hasn't been anybody that's been able, you know, to compete with the WWE. If you could have been uh, the head of it and you had unlimited funds, what would you have done differently? You know, it's a real difficult situation, especially these days. Um, wrestling is not at the peak right now. Wrestling is sort of in a valley. Uh, Monday Night Raw has had some serious bad ratings over the course of the last few months. And wrestling is just not that popular with the mainstream at this point. It's something that you almost need to have in order to have access and have an outlet to get on a good network. So the, the other big difference is when Turner turned things around, it was because we were able to offer guaranteed contracts to the wrestlers. The owner of the WWE, Vince McMahon, has been very hesitant at that point, this is in the late 90s, about guaranteed contracts for guys. Uh, we offered them. As a result, we were able to pick up a lot of the big name talent that later turned that organization around, that turned WCW around. So I think it would be very, very difficult these days because the WWE has such a stronghold. They have such a lock and they've locked up so many of the big names. You'd have to start from scratch. You'd have to start with the basics. And I think the key would be keep it, uh, you know, an athletic based uh, product. Don't try and copy the WWE, mm -hmm. you know, they're right now, they're the industry leader, go in a different direction and you might have success, but it's difficult. What was the favorite match you covered in your career? So difficult to narrow it down to one match. A couple of years ago, the Las Vegas Sun did an article on me and, and they went back and they figured out that, and this is several years back, that I had done like 2000 television shows. And when you think of how many matches are on each show. It could be five matches, could be 10 matches on a show. That's an awful lot of matches. So it's tough to narrow it down to one match. As far as, as an event goes, I think that that first one, uh, I just loved it, that AAA pay-per-view, When Worlds Collide in 94. As far as Turner goes, the time that I spent there, there was a group of wrestlers uh, called the Cruiserweights. This was the introduction of the smaller, lighter, flying wrestlers uh, in professional wrestling. It, it was done in, in other countries, sort of not in the United States, not in North America. Idea being that you needed to be six foot two, 250 pounds to be a professional wrestler. And we had guys like Rey Mysterio, we had guys uh, like Chris Jericho, Juventud Guerrera, Dean Malenko, a, a number of them. So I, I hate to narrow it down to just one match, but I would say the most fun that I had was calling those matches in particular involving those guys that are uh, more of the, the aerial stars and do a lot of high risk moves. Great stuff. We could talk all day with you and I hope we can get you back in studio sometime. Maybe when we get Johnny Detroit in, Perfect. I'll move out of the seat and let him uh, <laughs> in. And, you know, he threatened to come in and he was going to take a red eye last night and come crashing through the door <laughs> with a chair, hit me over the head and throw me off stage so that he could talk with you. But uh, I've been around that a few times. Yeah, you know, he thought that would have been great. Yeah, but maybe, uh, we, maybe we can do some Ric Flair stories and some Bobby Heenan stories and absolutely. a lot of the guys like uh, Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage that I worked with for so many years. On behalf of Wager Talk, you know, we look, do this series, the Friends of Wager Talk. I really want to thank you for coming in, and I do want to have you back again because we got so many different stories with you. And enjoy doing your podcast thank and you. uh, appreciate it, Mike. He's Mike Tanay. He's all over the place. But, guys, definitely check out his Professor Vegas podcast. This is a great show. I love listening to it each week, and uh, I was happy to be a part of it. You. Uh, and anytime you need me, give me a call. And, guys, Head over to Wager Talk. If you're brand new to Wager Talk, after you make your first $12 purchase, email support, give us your username. We'll put it a bonus $50. It's a sign up bonus in your account to use however you want at wagertalk.com. He's Mike Tanay. I'm Marco D'Angelo. Check out all of our other videos at wagertalk.com.